But our next speaker is Tim Blackmore from Infineon Technologies. He's the Global Verification Manager uh, for the ATV MC, um, which is automotive microcontrollers, is my understanding. Um, so primarily for the Infineon Oryx 3G family of microcontrollers. Uh, the verification of Oryx 3G is executed across several sites in Europe and Asia and it is the verification manager's job to put processes in place to ensure the execution is complete and consistent. Tim also has a technical leadership role with a focus on application of machine learning to verification and is a visiting industrial fellow at the University of Bristol. And the topic today is pre-silicon digital verification sign-off at Infineon ATV MC. See. Over to you, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, okay. So, okay, so um, yeah, I, I'll begin my presentation um, just by uh, setting a little bit of context. So, so I think there's a lot of commonality between what I'm going to present and what Nihit here presented, um, but um, I'll take a maybe a slightly more process orientated um, view of um, sign off. Um, so, yeah, so as Mike said, I'm the Global or Product Verification Manager for, for Infineon's RX 3G family of microcontrollers, um, and as such is my responsibility to define our verification processes. Um, so just a couple of notes here on the importance of processes. So, um, so the verification is executed by a large number of people um, who are quite um, geographically widely distributed, um, and so the processes are there to help to ensure consistency. Um, secondly, um, RX 3G is used in plenty of um, safety critical applications. Um, so not only is it important it works, but it's um, important that, um, that we demonstrate that we're complying with um, standards such as the ISO 26262 functional safety standard, um, so that we can so that we can demonstrate it works. And um, and and having and, and having processes in place helps us to show this compliance. Um, in, in this context, when I talk about in verification here, I mean verification in really quite a um, broad, um, uh, a really broad interpretation of verification. Um, so it, in, it includes, includes all the usual um, pre-silicon uh, verification um, disciplines such as digital verification, analog verification, AMS, power aware verification with the UPF and so on. Um, it also includes post-silicon verification so it includes validation characterization reliability qualification and so on um, but the focus for this present for this presentation I've just focused on uh, pre-silicon digital IP verification so um so, so all the examples um, I, the, the, um, the the principles of what I talk about will apply um, uh, applies to all, all of these verification um, disciplines but um, but I'll just use examples from digital IP functional verification. So, uh, so the, the the basis of my presentation is um, is, is really that sign off is is all in the preparation, and the and the preparation starts starts with a plan. So I've got a quote here from Pablo Picasso, um, extolling the virtues of a plan, uh, a plan in which people fervently believe and upon which they vigorously act, um, which uh, which all sounds very wonderful. As the author of the uh, product verification plan for Arc 3G. Um, so what is the product verification plan? Um, well, it, it's a number of things, but um, in particular, it, it, um, it does these um, three things highlighted in bold here. So it sets the verification objectives. Um, it describes the verification methods that you can use um, to achieve those objectives. And it stipulates what the targets are um, to, show, to show that you have um, achieved the objectives. And it's, it's really these three things um, which, which ensure um, consistency of execution uh, to some extent and, and certainly consistent consistency of um, sign off. So I've used uh, two very similar terms here. I've used the term objectives and the um, term targets. Um, so I just a, a couple of words on, on, on how they're different. Um, so when I talk about verification objectives, these can be really quite high level, quite abstract, um, and they can be written without any detailed knowledge of, of how they will um, actually be achieved. Um, so, so for instance, they can be written by non-verification experts, they can be written by concept engineers, they can be written by application engineers. Uh, when I talk about targets, though, um, targets are really about an expert interpretation of, of the objectives, so an interpretation given by an expert in verification. 
Uh, but most importantly, targets really must must give you an, an unambiguous pass or fail. Um, so, so we we know we've um, achieved our objectives by um, by by mapping these these targets onto these objectives, and then um, having an unambiguous pass for our targets. So, if I um, uh, dive down a bit into what the objectives are for um, for, for pre-silicon digital IP verification. Um, the first objective um, concerns requirements and features. So um, requirements and features are both types of verifiable statement. And a verifiable statement is something which can be reasonably mapped onto verification targets. Um, the difference between requirements and features are that requirements are written by concept engineers and features are written by uh, verification engineers. Um, and the features so the product verification plan um, defines methods that should be used to derive these features. Um, so there's a, a table of methods for deriving features in the in the product verification plan. Um, and the, the table extends similar tables in the ISO 26262 standard and includes methods such as analysis of boundary values. Um, so if you if you're verifying a range of values, you pay particular attention to um, to values um, at the limits of uh, that range. And another method is knowledge or experience-based error guessing. So a, a, a what can go wrong analysis um, of, of the design. Um, it's important also that verification engineers take input from other stakeholders. So um, a good example there is, um, is that they take input from design engineers um, as to what the um, corner cases in the actual design implementation are. Now, if we could, um, if we could confidently um, state that um, we captured all requirements and features, uh, then this, this would probably suffice. Um, but the truth is it's, um, it's possible that some requirements or features are missed, um, and, and so we have other objectives. Um, so the second objective here is that all RTL code has been exercised. So, so we know from experience that if there's any RTL code which hasn't been verified, uh, then it's, um, then it's um, likely to be buggy. Um, so we so we include this as a second objective, and and a and, and a final objective in case we've still missed something is that we um, apply extensive SOC testing uh, to the IP. So coming on to the methods and targets for IP verification, so that so the methods are, are mainly simulation-based verification, uh, perhaps some perhaps some emulation here, but um, not so much maybe for IP verification um, and formal verification. And the um, and and the targets, the determin the determinable pass fail criteria um, for simulation based verification are going to be based around test cases, which will be determined to pass if they don't fail any any checkers. Uh, a functional coverage model, which will be determined to pass if all its coverage items have been hit by pass and test cases. Um, we mentioned as an objective exercise in RTL code, so so one interpretation of what one way of exercising RTL code is to show that you've taken all branches, for instance, and we can say that, um, that a, a, a branch in RTL code can be a, can be determined as a pass if it's been taken by a pass and test. And, uh, and our final objective was SOAP testing, um, and we can translate that into a target of having a, a certain number of generated test cases passing. So those are the sort of targets we're talking about for simulation-based verification. Uh, for formal verification, um, your, your target's going to be based around properties. Um, your pro your pro you're going to want your, your properties to hold non-vacuously, um, or, or maybe um, uh, maybe you might be satisfied with a bounded hold. Um, property checking tools come with their own um, version of um, code coverage in them, um, so that might be more analogous to statement coverage, um, for example. And instead of talking about SOC testing, we might talk about exhaustive verification, informal verification, uh, which, which would be an analysis that your property set is complete. So these, these are our targets, which give us our unambiguous pass and file criteria. So, so that was the plan. The, the other part of the um, preparation is the um, specification. So there's one, there's one project, product verification plan, which sets, sets out the principles um, that are used for um, for uh, verification sign-off. Um, 
but each team, each each of these hundred or so teams will have to, um, uh, will um, derive their own verification specification um, because um, a specification is about being specific, and so it requires um, expertise in the IP. Um, so in the diagram here on the right, we have um, we have an example of a verification specification or part of a verification specification. Uh, the, the objectives of this um, assigned requirements and the derived features, features according to the methods um, stipulated in the product verification plan. Uh, we then have the um, verification targets, uh, the, um, the uh, functional coverage items and the, um, and the test cases. And to be sure we haven't missed anything, we also have a mapping of our targets onto our requirements. So we know, we know exactly when we've achieved our objectives. Uh, so missing from this verification specification is the um, is the code coverage um, uh, target, which um, which is which is given for free, and also the um, SIG testing target. Um, so so it would have to be specified um, how many seeds the team expects to run um, to to complete the SIG testing. And then from a process point of view, anyway, the the rest really is easy. You just um, execute your verification and you report all your targets have passed. So I've, I've probably um, skipped over one very important thing. Um, so, so a high quality verification specification is, is critical to get um, high quality verification sign off, uh, but you also need a high quality verification environment. So if you have a verification environment with inadequate checkers, then, um, then your 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 specification isn't going to get you get you through that. Um, so another another important part of sign off is uh, is the qualification of the verification environment, and um, and this can be um, based on um, based on review or the ability of the environment to detect mutations or inserted bugs um, in the design, or preferably a mixture of both. So just in summary, um, so. Um, so verification sign-off um, for us is about seven objectives, um, selecting the method um, to verify those objectives, um, mapping targets onto those objectives, executing the method, reporting all your targets have passed, and then you can deduce that your objectives have been achieved. So thank you for listening, um, and I think there's probably some time for some questions. Thanks, Jim. Yes, uh, there is time for questions. Thank you for that. Um, so we have some online. Um, the first question is from uh, Sylvian Plankelin, who got his question in first this time, so I think it's asked. Um, does it make sense for you to reuse your assertions done for formal verification in a dynamic context? Um, it may, yeah, it may make sense. Um, so your your assertion is useful. You so say your um, your uh, formal verification environment will have constraints on it. Um, it it's possible that those um, those constraints are too restrictive um, by mistake. Um, so it certainly makes sense for you to use those to to um, use those constraints as assertions in a verification environment um, to show that they haven't been um, uh, violated. Um, and and, of, of, and obviously, if you if you're relying on a bandit hold, then it may make sense to um, reuse your assertions, your your formal assertions in a in a simulation environment. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, a question from uh, Philip Olszewski um, regarding formal coverage. Um, I think you may have answered this, but anyway, do you apply techniques like mutation, also known as faulting? Objective detection as a sign-off criteria. Yeah, so I, I think yeah. Um, so, so first of all, um, to say that um, yeah, formal verification tools will have um, code coverage uh, metrics um, built in, and those code coverage metric metrics may themselves be based on uh, um, ability to detect mutations across your property set. Um, but yeah, independently of that, um, yeah, the, the formal verification. Um, that the property set will form part of the verification environment, which will um, which will be part of the, which will be qualified with mutation testing. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, a question from myself, actually, Tim. Um, so I've always found formal verification uh, metrics not as obvious as um, code coverage metrics, and quite hard to integrate with um, simulation-based metrics. 
So if you found a, a good way, a, a good formal cover, a formal metric that you'll use and, and integrate with dynamic or not? Yeah, so yeah, I mean, so one thing I, I didn't mention is in the, the, the product verification plan will also will, will say these are the methods you can use, and it will also say whether you can use a mix of those methods or not, and it will also say if you use a mix of those methods how you should how you should do it, and it, and it would certainly um, not allow you to blindly mix coverage um, between formal and and simulation. So I think, um, mm -hmm. I, I, so I think, um, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's time to max then, you know, all the gates in my design work, so my design works. Uh, I think you have to be careful how you, um, how you mix um, coverage across, um, uh, across the different methods. Okay. Okay. Um, I've got, we've got a question from Adrian Evans. Do you recommend tools like Certitude to find gaps in the verification? So, so certitude would be an obvious tool to use for mutation testing um, for the qualification of your verification environment. Okay. Other tools are available. I guess you have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be one of these tools. <laughs> and um, one of the things I found with mutation testing is it, it can be very performance hungry. Do you find that or not? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, Certainly, uh, yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a, a lot of best practice being developed around mutation testing, and I, and I think it's it's important to be aware of that best practice. Okay, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, and still some questions coming in, which is good. From Sylvia, another question from Sylvia: um, How do you map your objective with target on slide nine? Um, let me see if I can go back to it. Is it on slide nine? No, yeah. um, this one presumably. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is this this is done. It adds. So, so as I said, the <coughs> this requires interpretation by the verification engineers. So the verification engineers um, first of all have to sat satisfy themselves that their objectives are verifiable, um, so that they can be reasonably mapped onto targets, and then they have to um, then then they have to decide um, what the appropriate targets to map onto those objectives are. Um, so, th so this is down to interpretation by the verification engineers, and 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 it will be reviewed as well. Okay, okay, that helps. Um, uh, somebody else has asked a question, so I'll move to uh, Aditya Pulley. Um, and I think this may be drifting into a test rather than a functional verification, but I'll ask it. What kind of metrics do you use to sign off random transient, random transient fault verification? I think that uh, might be a test question. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this, so we're talking about um, uh, functional, uh, functional safety metrics. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so that's, that's probably a presentation in itself. But, but, but um, you'll have you'll have an FM EDA which which will give you um, target coverage for transient faults. And, um, and 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 that that will give you a metric to sign off against. Yeah, agreed. I think that's more of a, uh, a thought coverage question for test. Okay. Um, so we we have run out of time, Tim. Thank you very much for the presentation and for answering the questions. Um, we've got a good spread of uh, questions there and people. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank you.